Um, it's my honor to introduce Mikhail Malo Lava. He is our lead architect of Sparkling Water at H2O. He has a PhD from Charles University in Prague. And without further ado, uh, let Mikhail start his talk. OK. OK, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, thank you for introduction. So I'm like a software engineer at H2O doing a uh, lot of stuff and also sparking water. And I will speak about sparking water today. This, in, this is hands-on session, so you can uh, follow me later. I will do some quick introduction about the internals of sparking water. And then I will switch to the demo script so you can follow me, demo script, data, spark, sparking water, you can find on the USB stick. So just play and enjoy. So a lot of people asking us if they can use H2O as the part of their existing spark pipeline, which makes sense. You know, spark is really uh, used, it has nice API, it's the API is really easy to use for data munching. And people ask us, OK, can I use, after my data munching steps, can I use uh, your H2O deep learning? And the question is, of course, yes, you can use. And the solution for that is Sparking Water. Sparking Water is a project which is uh, integrating H2O inside the Spark ecosystem. That means that you can use H2O algorithms with the Spark data structures, with the Spark RDDs and Spark data frames. And vice versa, if you have some algorithm in H2O which is producing table, table of predictions, or uh, some similarities, you can take this table, this H2O table, and expose the table as uh, spark data structure. And we figure out that it really benefits if you plug, it will really benefit if you plug H2O into your existing spark pipeline. That's the main use case in the pipeline which needs some advanced machine learning algorithm. So how it works internally? If you run, if you run the spark, the spark will for you create JVMs, the nodes. They are called executors. Each executor is executing some commands uh, coming from Spark driver. You can see it on the left. And if it is happen, we can launch H2O on the top of such cluster. And the trick is that we will create, we call it H2O context. H2O context is the structure or the entity which holds uh, the state of H2O services. So we, if you create H2O context, you will see that during the demo, uh, inside the Spark cluster, it will go around the cluster, and on each node in the cluster, on each executor, it will launch H2O services. And I would really uh, stress that we will launch H2O services in the same JVM as Spark is running. So that means that we can see data from Spark, and Spark can see our data. So we can do a lot of clever tricks how to share data, how to transfer data, and how to observe like uh, behavior of the Spark, and Spark can see our behavior. So I will skip the next slide. This is just saying the same thing, and I will just zoom to the single JVM. Inside the single JVM, as I said, we are in, uh, running sites to side with the Spark. So if you have some data in Spark RDD on the left, you can take it and publish as H2O frame, which is the H2O data structure, and vice versa. The one direction is easy. If you have data already in H2O frame, that's the right side, you can transfer it to the RDD or data frame or any like Spark data structure by creating simple wrapper around the uh, H2O data frame. The opposite direction from spider structure to H2O frame is a little bit more 
uh, interesting. We cannot currently use a Spark Dust structure to execute our distributed machine learning algorithms. So we have to take data which are stored in RDD and put them to our data structure, which can be expensive. I have to admit that it can, it can duplicate the data. On the other hand, in H2, we are doing a lot of clever tricks internally. We will compress data, we will distribute them around the cluster, we will look at the, what is the distribution of the piece of the data, and we will do the maximum effort to compress the data. So for numeric data, we can see like a really hu huge compression factor for uh, data transfer from the SPAR. Of course, if you have, let's say, textual data, we will not be able to compress that them too much as numeric data, but yeah. If you have data already in H2 frame, after the transfer, you can, of course, unparasis, delete the data in the RDD. So you can like increase, uh, you can decrease the memory footprint. So that's the basic, the basic concept inside the, uh, inside the Spark in water. So it's just a library on the top of the Spark. You can launch Spark services and transfer the data from the Spark to H2 and back. And in fact, that's all. So let's play with it. So let's design some nice application. Who was uh, already on the talk about Databricks? This is the same application, but we will go a little bit deeper and step by step through individual steps. The name of the application is HEM or SPAM. And that means that we'll detect some spam messages. The input of our examples are raw text messages. The mails, text messages from your cell phone, which are annotated by annotations, by the binary annotation, ham or spam. Spam is just the bad message. Ham is the, the, you know, the good one. Everybody like it. So I would like to detect all the bad messages in, inside this data set. So the goal of the whole example is to define or for a given text message, we would like to detect if it is spam or not. So I divided whole pipeline, whole, demo, whole hands on to several steps. And in the first step, we'll load data, extract them from data source, then we will parse data, we know that the input data have two columns, annotation and actual text message, so it's easy parse. And then we'll tokenize data, tokenize the textual messages. Then we will use TF-IDA, which is inverse document frequency uh, model to trans transform the tokens, which compose the messages, to uh, numeric vectors. And if we have numeric vectors, that's perfect input for H2. Num table of numbers, just take it, pass it to deep learning, and build deep learning model. If you have deep learning model in hand, you can build simple predict predictor, which will give you, for a given message, answer, this is the spam, this is not spam. So let's do that. I will start as the, sp as the first step, I will create the environment. I will use free Spark nodes, and on the top of these free Spark nodes, I will execute uh, H2O. I will, for this goal, I will use Sparking Shell, and this is a simple example, so you can follow me on your laptop. I designed that to be run on, like, even with the small memory footprint, and so let's start. So this is, I hope you can see that. So this is the example uh, flow which we will execute. So first step, we have to prepare the environment. So on a USB stick, you have the Spark distribution and you have a uh, Sparkling shell. So I will first set up, I will first set up, oops. I don't want to see this one. Spark Home, and I will point to Spark 1.5. And I need to set up this environment variable, Spark Home. 
So right now it's pointing to Spark 1.5. Not the latest one, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter in this example. So that's the first step. Export Spark home to your Spark distribution. The second step, point the environment variable master to some string. In this is the Spark specific setup. So I'm just saying, launch me local cluster on this machine. Uh, I mean the Spark, Spark cluster, visually composed of three nodes, and the maximum memory allocated per node is four, giga, four gigabytes. And let's run Sparkling Shell. Sparkling Shell is just wrapper around regular Spark Shell. Really, if I will show you the Sparkling Shell script, you will see just execute Spark Shell. Plus, there is one command line option, dash dash jars, and it will, it will pass a Sparkling Water Library to the Spark runtime. So we just provide this small shortcut, and I will execute the Sparkling Shell. You will see some output. Right now, the Spark a Spark shell is starting. You see some technical information about the current Spark cluster, about the distribution of the spa, uh, Sparkling shell. You will see also some warnings from the Spark. It's complaining about uh, the setup, about the default setup. And my Spark is running. So just show you that it's running. I will go to localhost. 4040, which is the location of the Spark UI. And you will see there are three executors. I asked for a cluster of three, so there are three executors. And one additional node, which is driver. That's the Spark shell running. And right now, I execute nothing. So there is no data, no execution performed. So I will go back to the example and prepare the environment. I will point to data file. I will modify this because my data file is in a little bit different location. So my data file is in small data example, smsdata.txt. <clears throat> and then I will just prepare the environment. I will just import bunch of Spark classes and H2 classes just to have nice working environment. So that's the first step. So the next step, I have to prepare some building blocks to build my uh, spam detector. So the first step, I need representation for the uh, messages, for the input messages. So I will use simple Scala case class, which is saying this is the annotation for the message, and this is the message uh, represented by some feature vector. So I will just use, the, use it, copy paste it to the Spark shell. The next step is to load the data. In this case, I have two options. I can use H2 parser or Spark. Spark API to load data. The data are uh, quite uh, simple. It's just two columns, one column with annotation and message. So it's easy to parse. So I will use directly Spark par parser and parse this data. For more uh, interesting data sets, I would recommend to use directly H2 parser which we really tuned for the last three years, and we tested on a lot of uh, customer, customers' data sets, and it's really like stable and tuned for different kind of the data. But for this example, just Spark API is enough. So I load the data, and I have RDD, which is the Spark structure of the strings. So I need to tokenize this RDD. I need to tokenize each message stored in the RDD. So I will define another function. And again, I don't need to go to H2 API yet. We don't support at this level so uh, nice API to manipulate with the 
input RDDs. So I will just stay in the Spark and do the stuff in the Spark because, because it's right now easier for me. So I will just take incoming messages and for each message I will tokenize it to the words. I will get rid of the words which are not important and also I will delete all the characters which are not important. So this is the next building, 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 building block. I forget to, ah, okay, one more. This is the next building block which I need to provide. So I'm still living in the Spark land. So right now I tokenize each, each message. So each message is represented by a sequence of tokens. So I still have to do one additional step to transform this sequence of tokens to the sequence of numbers, to the some numeric vector. For uh, this kind of job, you can use different algorithms. In this case, I already mentioned, I will use TF IDA, which is a really simple way how to compute the frequency of the words and scale them with respect to the frequency of the word inside the sentence and inside a full document. And in this case, I will also use Spark API. It's already ready there, so I don't need to write any HTO code right now. I will just directly use Spark and call TF IDF, transform data, and this method will output me for each message, it will output the vector of numbers. So this is the next building block. So right now, in the pipeline, I have at the end for each message, I have the annotation of the message and some uh, vector of numbers. So that's perfect setup for HTO. I can take it and directly pass it to the HTO deep learning. So I will build another small uh, building block which will invoke HTO deep learning, and I will use directly our Java API in this case, and I will quickly explain what uh, what is the uh, goal, what is the strategy behind our Java API, and uh, launching the algorithms. If you would like to launch the algorithm, you have to create two objects. The first object is parameter pro object. It, it defines what are the uh, configuration parameters for the algorithm. In this case, we will set up model ID, which is the identif identification of the model inside the HTO. We will set up the training data set used for model uh, creation and validation data set. I can pass here validation data set directly, which is quite handy because we will do on the fly validation. So at the end of the model building, you will know the quality of the model on this validation data set. Then we just set up classical response column because this is supervised, supervised learning and technical parameters for, for uh, deep learning. So number of the epochs, so that means how many times will go through the training data, the L1 penalty, and the number of hidden layers. So in this case, default settings is two hidden layers, 200 neurons per, per layer. So this is the first object which I need to create, and the second object is the model builder, which is in our terminology a job. This is asynchronous entity, so if I will call deep learning dot train model, it will create a new job and run it. So I don't want to use asynchronous, asynchronous API in this case, so I will call get here, so this will block till the end of the run. And that's all. So I, I can build deep learning model in this, in this case. So let me copy the deep learning model to the console. So we have deep learning model and I think we have all the small building blocks ready. We can load data, we can tokenize data, we can uh, 
transform uh, text data to the numeric vectors, and then we can build the model. So it's time to start HTO. So in this case, we'll create HTO context, and that's the entry point or the thing which will initialize HTO services on each node in the cluster and uh, expose them for you. So let me copy this. So it will launch some distributed operation. So we have to wait for the end of the operation, and it will print that it's ready and number number of the number of the nodes. So you can see the HTO context reported three nodes, and there is uh, HTO flow UI exposed at this IP. So I will just copy this string and show you that I'm not lying, that HTO is running. So this is the classical HTO flow UI. You probably saw, saw it already during, during preview sessions. And I can type any, any commands. I can see, OK, there are three nodes running. And I can ask, are there any data? Not yet. So let's put there some data. One more benefit of running HTO on the top of the Spark is that we'll expose all the default services. So if you launch HTO on the top of the Spark, you'll be able to access the flow. You'll be, you will be able to use R package and also Python package. Everything for free. So let me switch back to the, to the flow and let's put all the, all the steps, all the building blocks together. So we'll load data, we'll tokenize data, we'll build TF-IDF model. Then when we prepare the input data, this is the crucial line, we'll call HTO context dot, dot as HTO frame, and this will say expose this data, uh, this that data frame, this part data frame as HTO frame. So from this point, we'll be able to see the data inside the HTO, and we'll be able to split data with HTO API and run and build deep learning model. So let's copy these guys to the sparkling shell and execute them. So I will copy. Oops, there was some error, so let me go back. I forget something. Probably, uh, da -da. ah, my fault. I probably used the wrong, the wrong uh, path to data, so let me fix that. So I will use examples, small data, SMS data .txt and oops and try to execute the next step. Uh, I'm spam RDD just to verify that okay now it can see the data. So it was probably the typo when I was typing the script the location of the data. So I will execute the same, the same code again. It will do the steps which I, which I defined. Load data, tokenize them, build TF-IDF model, publish data as HTO frame, and then build, split the, uh, split the data to training and validation part, and then uh, build deep learning model. So I can go to the HTO flow and ask for the jobs. Oh, there is one running job deal, which is building deep learning model. So I can go back to the, to the console, and it printed uh, something, so I can print the rest of the model. So these are the, some uh, statistics ab about the model, but it's quite messy in the console. I don't like that, so I will click, I will switch to the flow, and I can directly 
explore the model, the quality of the model. So I'm interested in the validation data. This is AOC curve. You can see that it's pretty, it's pretty good. But I was a little bit cheating before because the data size is a little bit small. And I know that the, the deep learning will perfectly uh, predict this data. But it was designed to run on your laptops. And you can, you can use any, any functionality of HTO. And I still would point that this is running on the top of the Spark. So we can still go to the Spark, export data from the Spark. You can still go to the flow and export data from the flow. I can look at the Pojo, at the generated code of the model, and that's perfect. So I will go back to the, to the script. I can also look, I can also query the Scala API of the HTO and ask HTO, give me model metrics about, about the model, but it is not so interesting because I prefer to see the model metrics directly from the flow. So it will give you the, the values which are used for plotting this curve. So I will skip this step and go directly to the, to the creation of the spam detector. So spam detector is in fact a function which will take a message, incoming message from your mailbox and it will say spam, not spam, with some kind of a with some uh, threshold. And that's, I designed this method in this way. So it will take the message, it will take train models, and the threshold for the good message. And then the crucial point here that you have to replay all the operations which I did during the training. So I have to take raw message which is in the, on the input, tokenize it, then run through the TF-IDF model, which will produce the long numeric vector, and then finally I can pass this long numeric vector to HTO deep learning model. And HTO deep learning model will give me the prediction. Three values. Prediction with the default threshold and uh, the probability of HAM and the probability of SPAM. So I will just use them, use the probabilities, and decide if the, if the message represents the spam message or hand message. So I will copy this piece of the code to the console again. So I define my, my predictor, and now I can ask questions. So I received this message yesterday. Michal, H2 word party tonight. No, tonight, tomorrow. Sorry, it's, it's in tomorrow, in Mountain View. So it's H2 word party. Everybody is invited here, so don't forget to go to the Castro on Tuesday night. So I am just interested, was it spam or ham? So let's run it. And, ah, it's a ham, okay. Now I will probably go to the party. The second, second message is another message I received. And it was like some random, you know, I'm, like, I'm not a native speaker, but it's hard to understand this message. Even So I am suspicious about this message. So I will just run it through, through my simple spam detector. And yes, spam detected, perfect. I will just delete the message. So, yeah, that's all. If you have any question, please, I'm here. Questions? Thank you. Um, just wondering if it'll work with Spark on Yarn. Uh, yes, yes, so this uh, Spark on, in fact, Spark in Water, that's the main use case. So. Also, our main testing scenario, which we see from a lot of customers, that they are running, running Spark on the Yarn. And this is, uh, in fact, the best use case, I would say. Much more better than running on different cloud providers. So my question is uh, whether the HO has to install the Spark clusters uh, master node. 
Oh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So uh, it's H2O has to be installed into the Spark Cluster's master node? Uh, no, uh, in fact, no. Uh, we, design, we designed uh, Sparky Water in the way that uh, it's just a library on the top of the Spark. So you deploy your application as standalone Spark application, but you just attach additional uh, jar to the class path. So there is like uh, dash dash jars option for Spark submit. When you are submitting your Spark application and you, you just pass their uh, reference to the Spark Invoter library. Or you can use, I will show it in different window. Oops. You can use Spark packages. So Uh, Spark Summit or Spark Shell has the option packages, which is like uh, the bundle which is uh, stored somewhere in the Maven repository, so you can directly point to this package. And this is really convenient way how to use Spark in water. You don't need to download anything, just, you just need raw Spark. It can be, uh, you can run it on the Spark, on the YAN, and then just point packages option to the Spark in water. And in this case, I was just pointing to the slide, to version 1.5.2, but you can point to any version based on your Spark version. So the, this, is, this was really intention of the design of the Spark Inverter. No modification of Spark at all. Okay, maybe you said, you mentioned this, but you only start uh, the Spark cluster, you, you yes. don't have to start a separate uh, H2O cluster. Yeah, I just start Spark cluster. And, and that also will start the, the flow server? Yeah, so if you start uh, Spark cluster by default, there is no H2O running. So user has to explicitly create H2O context. And from the H2O context creation, we will expose all the services. We will expose the flow, and we will also expose the REST API which, which is the crucial interface for the R package and uh, Python package. A user earlier was asking about Hive and how to work with Hive tables in Spark. Could you go in a little detail on that? Uh, yeah, so, you know, like uh, one of the benefits of using the Spark in water or h on the top of the Spark is that you can use any functionality which is already provided in the Spark. So, you know, Spark is a really huge project. It, uh, they have like, I think more than 500 committers or contributors. So they have really, really big development speed and there are a lot of interesting features. So you can use a uh, loader for Hive data directly from Spark, load Hive data to RDD and then manipulate data with the Spark API. And if you are ready, you just switch to the h frame and run h algorithms or H2 data managing or H2 transformations. Any more questions? All right, let's give Mikhail a hand. Thank you for the attention.